Hi, Sally. We've made this film to celebrate your work, but in particular, your bold vision in establishing the NIHR Biomedical Research Centers and your uncompromising commitment and focus on excellence. Sally, this is your legacy. Thank you. The UK has always been at the forefront of revolutions in science and healthcare. But historically, there's been a problem. Discoveries took too long to translate into life-saving treatments. Scientists and clinicians tended to work in silos, and their patients very rarely saw any immediate benefit from their research. Before the NIHR and before the biomedical research centres, things were really difficult. People struggled, I think, to deliver high-quality research. There was a real lack of infrastructure linking basic discovery science to experimental medicine, so across the university NHS interface. In 2007, Dame Sally Davis spearheaded a massive investment into translational research with a vision that put the needs of our patients at the heart of our research agenda. In so doing, she transformed the research landscape and the way we brought that benefit to our patients at the front lines of our NHS. I remember very clearly what it was like when the first BRCs were established. At first we were uncertain, but it soon became clear that this innovation would be absolutely transformational. What we're talking about here is scientific world-leading excellence aligned to an NHS hospital partner that was bold enough to consider taking on translation. All of a sudden, we had the funding to recruit the right people, to put in place the right facilities um, that allowed us to do what we've been struggling to do on a shoestring for, for several years. Today, we see that bold yet risky endeavor paying off. There are now 20 biomedical research centers across the country, bringing cutting-edge research more directly to the bedside than ever before, attracting global talent, transforming countless lives and enriching the local and the national economy. A new focus on agility and collaboration now means that discoveries have a chance to make it from the lab to the bedside in a matter of months. Here at Moorfields, we have several gene therapy and genetic therapy clinical trials. This was unheard of 10, 20 years ago. We now have a large spectrum of research going on in Manchester. We've also got the first NHS deployed proton beam therapy unit in the country. We have developed a rapid whole genome sequencing project for children who are severely ill in either the neonatal intensive care or paediatric intensive care. The multidisciplinary nature of the BRCs has also fostered a unique culture of collaboration, breaking down the barriers between discovery science and clinical practice. From the very beginning, the Intelligent Surgical Device Project was funded by the Imperial BRC. We can tell about the aggressiveness of a tumor, what kind of drugs it would be uh, sensitive to, so, so we can, in real time, contribute to surgical decision making. We are put together with our natural collaborators. For instance, how uh, our breast cancer project started, it was a surgical BRC theme meeting. Immediately, the breast surgeon said that, oh, we can do it. And uh, in three months uh, from that point, uh, we had our first uh, breast cancer case. Another benefit of this collaboration has been the establishing of several bioresources. These are sample banks and data sets that provide an invaluable resource for any number of research projects. BioAid is a collaboration between a number of BRCs. And it's essentially an altruistic bioresource for use by anybody who wants to do research on patients with suspected infection. We've established a mental health bar resource, recruited almost exclusively through social media, with over 20,000 samples waiting for DNA extraction. And we're starting to see additional investment. The cutting-edge infrastructure has allowed many BRCs to spin off innovative companies, bringing additional revenue 
back into their research efforts and into the NHS. BRC has been instrumental in allowing us to develop really novel therapies for patients with rare disease. We are right at the forefront of gene therapy treatments and of new technologies such as uh, CRISPR technologies with gene editing to treat and, and we believe cure conditions such as childhood leukaemia where other conventional treatments haven't worked. The BRCs have also enabled us to build the infrastructure necessary to manufacture advanced cell therapy products. We've been able to spin out um, several companies from activities within the BRC, one example of which is Orchard Therapeutics. The BRCs together have actually helped to generate a whole new industry of cell and gene therapy, actually bringing it out of academia, which is where it has been for many years, into the clinic. So I think a good example, particularly related to the Biomedical Research Centre at Guys and St Thomas's and King's College London, was a treatment of transplant rejection with uh, a regulatory form of T-cell. We have spin-out companies in gene therapy for haemophilia, spin-out companies in new diagnoses for prostate cancer. There are numerous spin-outs creating enormous amounts of money, potentially, uh, to be invested back into either the discovery part of the pathway or the patient care part of the pathway. We're now seeing this pioneering infrastructure translate into treatments that change lives, offering new hope to patients across the country and across the world. I have a couple of odd diseases, one of which is a rare disease called primary sclerosis and cholangitis. I'm pretty ill on a regular basis, but not quite ill enough to end up on the transplant list. And the lovely doctors here look after me and keep me going. We are trialling use of mesenchymal stromal cells in two disease cohorts, which is PSC and autoimmune hepatitis. As it stands, there is no cure for either of these conditions, and eventually patients do require liver transplant. I usually only have about three or four hours of usable energy a day, and I have to ration that very carefully. But instead, after I had the treatment, I was painting walls in my house. I was, I was going, I'm going to mow the lawn, I'm going to do this. And Eventually that wore off over the next six to eight weeks um, and I, I think I'm back to where I was before but hopeful that I can get more of this amazing new medication or maybe a larger dose that would last for longer. So he was the first um, in Merlin and therefore the first person to re receive these mesenchymal stromal cells in the whole of the West Midlands. So we're very proud of that achievement. If we can stop the fatigue happening that they get from the disease progression, I think that would have an incredible impact on their lives. It would really help. i got endless gratitude for them. Even if it comes to nothing, the fact that people are trying to make my life better means more than I can put into words. With training programmes and opportunities for scientists, clinicians, technical and support staff, BRCs attracted world-class talent and were able to respond with agility and ambition to the changing needs of healthcare. So in the last 10 years, I think uh, the NIHR has built, for example, fantastic training, building teams of people where we have access now to fellowships um, and training programmes. I did a PhD in the Cardiovascular Research Centre in Leicester, um, and my um, area of interest was looking at uh, novel imaging techniques, specifically MRI scanning, in patients with aortic stenosis. I think the one area that Dame Sally in particular has made a, an absolutely amazing difference is to the careers of women, delivering real tangible difference into how we as women can progress in terms of our careers, but also giving us opportunities. I see the next generation of women coming through who can't remember what it used to be like, and I think their future is really bright. Cardiovascular sciences, where I work, has traditionally been regarded as a very male-dominated specialty. Athena Swan is important because it just brings the subject of gender equality right to the table and it just highlights it as an issue. The NIHR has linked it with its funding for the future, which I think is a really good idea. The NIHR research community now consists of a diverse and highly skilled workforce, ready to take on the challenges of the future. We do large pieces of work on antimicrobial resistance. It is at the moment dominated by the work on TB. 
And that's for a simple reason. It is now emerging as one of the dominant threats of antimicrobial resistance to global health. Pushing the agenda from the policy side has been critical, and the BRC and the NIHR has really enabled us to do some incredible work that is cross-cutting and multidisciplinary. Another example of the work we're doing in antimicrobial resistance is in the vaccines theme. There are many ways in which vaccines can actually be a critical tool in the antimicrobial resistance battle. We're working on technologies that we can use to support decision-making about prescribing. This use of sensors and artificial intelligence will really give us an opportunity to inform how we can dose these drugs better. The translation of science into treatments and diagnosis is a very, very difficult process. It requires a lot of effort, uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of working with industry and working with patients. We're at a very exciting point in medicine where advances in genomics, advanced therapies, data analytics are allowing us to do things in a very different way than we've done in the past. I was diagnosed with lymphoma about three, three and a half years ago. I've had four, four lots of chemo. Doctors couldn't do any more. I had only one choice, and that was to go on the CAR T-cells. CAR T-cell therapy has um, been one of the most important advances in the treatment of um, patients with um, lymphoma, um, and also children and young adults with, with leukemia. And a significant proportion of these patients can now be cured when they wouldn't have been in the past. Martin was a standout individual in his field with a fantastic set of intellectual property, but also the infrastructure provided by the BRC was really fundamental to the investment that we made. You engineer the immune system to be able to recognize cancer cells for the first time. So these are for patients, for instance, who don't respond to conventional treatments such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We're able to offer them now, thankfully, this lifeline. You look at it in two ways. I'm either walking dead or I'm walking history. It's a very, very quick reaction, very, very quick, um, almost almost dissipated within days. I'm here to have something actually work and have a little bit of hope for the next, next few years. I would have been knocking on Evan's door, I suppose. I've got 10 years, 20 more years, whoever knows now. From cancer treatments that use a patient's own immune system to attack their cancer cells, to fighting antimicrobial resistance and harvesting the potential of artificial intelligence, the biomedical research centres have changed the way we do research. It is the dream of every clinician scientist to see their work make a real difference in the real world. It is the hope of our patients that our science and our medicine will be there for them when the time comes. And that is what the biomedical research centres in all their scale of ambition are all about. The BRCs have provided a pathway from bench to bedside. They have brought patients into the centre of researchers and scientists' focus. Before there wasn't a lot of choice and now we're being able to go to families and say, these are all the options that are, that are open to you, whether it's gene therapy, bone marrow transplants or other form of treatments. We're seeing those children grow up, go to school and make friends and just do all these wonderful normal things that you would expect children to be doing. The BRCs have had a dramatic effect on our ability to actually make those dreams uh, come true. So Sally, this legacy, it was a bold vision that is now being delivered, transforming the UK into a biomedical translational research powerhouse invigorating our life science economy and delivering life-saving innovation. You know, when you go into a research facility and you meet a patient without hope, as I've done, where all treatments have been exhausted and there's nothing left, to be able to offer a treatment developed in a British university, delivered to a patient for the first time in the world in our NHS hospitals and saving their lives, that is a humbling experience, Sally and that is your legacy. Thank you.